Thank you all for sticking with us. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we have some incredible panelists uh, with us today. If you're just tuning in, my name is Ashley Fay, and I'm the Development Director at Refugee Services of Texas. And I am so gratified to see so many people tuning in today. I was just looking at all the countries represented um, in our audience today. I mean, we have Kenya, 1 a.m. over there. Thank you. Mexico, Canada, Colombia, Switzerland, Wales. Welcome, everybody. Not to mention all over the United States and Matamoros, which is really special. So thank you all so much for being here. I'd like to go ahead and introduce the panelists that we'll have today. First, we have Robert Bellheimer. He has directed critically acclaimed films for 30 years that focus, although not exclusively, on global human rights issues. In 1989, Robert was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary for Cry of Reason, a feature-length film that profiles the South African anti-apartheid leader, Dr. Byers uh, Nodea. Over the past 15 years, two of Robert's films, A Closer Walk, about the global HIV AIDS epidemic, and Not My Life about global human trafficking have been see seen by hundreds of millions of people across a broad set of global demographics, platforms, and networks. In 2019, Robert was awarded the Mother Teresa Memorial Award for Social Justice. We also are being joined by Angelica Solsol, who is one of our incredible uh, RST clients in our Asylum Seekers Assistance Program. Angelica is from Guatemala, where she escaped life-threatening violence from her husband, whose position as a leader in the local police force prevented her from seeking help. Angelica walked through Mexico while pregnant, survived a kidnapping and being held hostage, and made her way to Texas and RST, where she's working hard to overcome obstacles for herself and for her daughter. Her translator and case manager, Ahmed Abbas, is also here with us today. Ahmed is the very dedicated supervisor of RST's Asylum Seekers Assistance Program and the perfect person for the job as an asylum seeker himself. We also have Lee Gallant, who is a lawyer at ACLU's national office in New York. He's widely recognized as one of the country's leading public interest lawyers and has argued dozens of important civil rights cases during his career including in the U.S. Supreme Court and virtually every federal court of appeals in the country. In addition to his work at the ACLU, he is an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School and for several years was a visiting professor at Yale Law School. During the past four years, he has argued some of the country's highest profile cases, including a national class action challenge to the Trump administration's unprecedented practice of separating immigrant families at the border. And last but definitely not least, we are honored to have Sister Norma Pimentel with us. Sister Norma is a Mexican-American nun of the Missionaries of Jesus and the Director of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. She was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2020, and she has been praised by Pope Francis and others for her work with refugees and immigrants coming to the United States. She has also gained international attention for her work and for her speaking out against the previous administration's inhumane migration protection protocols or MPP in the family separation policy. Thank you so much, all of you for being here. And to our audience, I would just like to remind you, if you have any questions uh, throughout our talk today, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so, Bob, let's go ahead and start with you. Um, first of all, before we dive into questions, there must have been so many people involved in this film. Do you have any words for them? Uh, I did the mute button. Good. Um, off to a good start. Hi, Ashley. Hi, everybody. Thanks an awful lot for coming. Yeah, I um, and thanks for asking that question. I'm going to pretend uh, for a minute that we're at the Oscars, okay, and I'm going to take this list of thank yous and read it. <laughs> uh, just so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure to cover everyone in, in, in these thank yous. There have basically been, you know, dozens and dozens of folks, um, you know, involved in this project, uh, starting with the worldwide family of colleagues and friends that we've had for 20 or 30 years. Um, our funders, of course, and they number over a dozen in No Mercy alone. Um, our creative team, whose uh, core members 
you just saw on the video credits just now, but that's a larger group as well. Um, and uh, everyone obviously who participated in the film itself, especially the migrants in, in Matamoras um, and Sister Norma, but again, it's a, a pretty large group of folks. And, uh, you know, finally, I'd like to give a shout out to um, the boss, uh, the man himself, Mr. Bruce, uh, whose contributions artistically to this film, I think are just absolutely superb um, and really reflective of um, the greatest, great artist and, and human being uh, that he is. So thanks Bruce uh, for everything. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, and thank you, Ashley and Texas Refugee Services for hosting this and all the work that's gone into it. God bless you all and thanks a lot. Thank you so much for that. I think you're ready for the Emmys now. Um, <laughs> so thinking, Bob, about the vast impact of your work, uh, what do you hope to accomplish with this film? I, I, historically, what we tried to do with our work is to change dangerous and exclusionary narratives among a large group of people. And, and that's what we're trying uh, to do here. Um, you know, an example in our previous work was when we came to the AIDS epidemic and we're talking with the Gates Foundation and others. And, um, you know, this was at a time when gay men were seen as responsible for the spread of AIDS. And what we really did uh, with A Closer Walk, which was the film we made, about that with the help of Bono and other activists and, and President Bush himself, uh, who actually put a huge amount of money, you know, into um, um, medication, making the medications available, uh, is that we really kind of, you know, together we sort of flipped this around so that AIDS was no more seen as you know, a marginalized kind of disease for gay men, um, but as um, a, a disease of, 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 of poor women. And we helped everybody think differently about that. And that's exactly what we're gonna try to do with, with, with o, o Mercy is to deconstruct stereotypes um, around who immigrants are, what they are, why they've come here, what the problems and issues are. And so the people start to think of them as human beings again. Not again, but you know, um, there's a lot of work to do there, I think. In some cases, again, that's true. Um, and I think that you accomplished this beautifully. Um, I'd like to talk to Angelica. Angelica, many people believe that asylum seekers come to the US for economic opportunity and don't understand that those who risk coming all the way here are really in danger. Can you share what prompted you to make the journey all the way from Guatemala to the United States? If you can just give us a couple minutes of what made you decide to come all this way. Angelica, ¿cómo estás hoy? ¿Estás bien? ¿Me escuchas bien? Puedes apuntar la, el micrófono en tu pantalla para que... Para... Ah, ahorita yeah. te escucho. Ándale. ¿Estás bien? Sí. Bueno, ahorita queremos preguntarte una cosa, por favor. Eh, mucha gente aquí cree, dicen que mucha gente de, de los migrantes que pasan de Guatemala, de México, de cualquier país de Latinoamérica, vienen solamente por razones económicas. Y creo que no, que no es la verdad. Entonces, queremos que, por favor, nos dicen por qué tú saliste, tomaste todo este viaje hasta acá, con todos los peligros, hasta llegando hasta acá, por favor. Bueno, en mi país eh, sí es cierto que nosotros tenemos necesidades económicas allá, pero no es el caso para venir en un país que no conocemos. En mi caso, yo tomé la decisión de venir a pesar de que yo tenía un buen trabajo allá en Guatemala y podía sacar adelante sola a mi hija, pero lamentablemente eh, tuve el papá de mi hija eh, quería que yo lo abortara y me empezó a amenazar y hasta estuvo a punto de, de a, tratar de atropellarnos con, con una moto y estando yo embarazada y las llamadas, los mensajes de amenazas que si yo no voy a abortar por las buenas, lo va a hacer por las malas 
Y entonces okay, fue la de... Permítame un, un segundito, permítame un segundito, porque voy a, voy a decir un parte de esto, luego vamos a seguir. He's telling me now is that uh, it is true that uh, in Guatemala there is lots of poverty. However, my case, her case, uh, was not so much. I had a decent job uh, in the uh, desk job, and uh, I life could have offered me more than that. The problem was is that uh, I had uh, a daughter with a certain. Uh, police officer there and he didn't want the daughter and he wanted me to uh, to have an abortion and I refused to have an abortion and he started to uh, threaten me blackmail me to the point that one time he tried to uh, to hit her with a motorcycle and continued with uh, with the messages of uh, blackmail messages and so on until I decided to go por favor sigue y yo no tenía planificado de venir en este país, no pensaba venir en este país y fueron las amenazas que, me, que he recibido en mi contra y poder salvar a mi hija y poder estar bien. Por eso es que me vine en este país, no porque por gusto estoy aquí. Por eso me duele estar lejos de mi familia. Because of those threats, because I reached the point that There was no possible, not just a good life, any life there, saving the life of my daughter. I had to take all this very risky journey. If I would choose, I would choose to live peacefully in Guatemala with my family. But this, this option was not, was not there. And, and Halika, we're going to come back to you and we're going to hear some more of your story. Um, but I'd like to switch over to Sister Norma. Hi, Sister Norma. Um, is Angelica's story representative of the people living in the Matamoros camp? How would you describe the population there? Oh, you're on mute, sister. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I have uh, been fortunate to visit almost re regularly and, and hear the stories like Angelica's story of the situations they go through and why they have to leave their country which is uh, truly out of the fear they have, especially for their children, you know, they would, I think, prefer to stay home. You know, they, that is their place where they grew up, where they live, where they have families and their culture and they are forced to leave. And, and uh, economical reasons is maybe true, but it's because of the corruption and the extortions and all the violence and fear that it's impossible to work there. And so uh, people leave um, in search of a place that's safe. And that's a story after a story of how they have been abused and mistreated and attacked and fear for their lives, especially that of their children. Right. And um, true to who she is, Sister Norma won't be with us the whole time tonight because she has people to help. Um, so I'd like to ask you just a couple more questions before you have to leave, Sister. Uh, what kinds of resources are provided at the camp and what role do you and other supporters play in providing assistance to the residents there? When these families were sent back after entering the United States, asking for asylum, asking for protection and safety, They were sent back to wait in Mexico, right across the, bri the bridge and the border of the United States with Mexico on their own, with no money, with no sense of what to do and where to go and just uh, lost and, and fearful. And, and so they were out in the open and thanks to organization like ours and many others, they uh, were able to get the basic things that they need like water. You know, you think water is something everybody has. Well, it's not true. Here you had several thousands of people out in the streets of this, in right across from the bridge and the hot sun and not able to have enough water, maybe one bottle of water for thousands of them that they had to share that for the day, you know? And so finding ways to collect funds so that we can pay for those things that are basic like food, water, a small tent, and just basic things that they needed just to exist as a human person. And so thank God we were able to organize ourselves and, and help the camp become more 
uh, uh, in a way more responsive to the needs that they have, put porta potties and put showers and put things like this and, and really build the community there among themselves, thanks to the many organizations that join together to give them that sense of dignity. And from your perspective as a service provider, what actions does our government need to take to alleviate the situation of asylum seekers at the border? What needs to happen is to us uh, here in the United States, be able to develop policies that respect life, human life, that processes and responses can be considerate of humanity and be able to come up with solutions that that are win-win for everybody, that, that we don't need to mistreat somebody. Do, we don't need to lose our humanity in the process of trying to come up with solutions that we think are the best. You know, I think that our responsibility as a nation, as a people, is to be able to, to respond to humanity in a dignified way. And so I think that is what we're all called to be and to do and to support and encourage our leaders in our country and our families and our communities to do. And how can the public, how can the audience support asylum seekers in the work that you're doing? They can welcome them. Open your hearts to, to recognize that they're there among you in your community and they need to be part of who you are into your church, into your uh, what you do in, and because they need to be embraced as people and recognize that they are here and that they need help and they need us to support them. And so you can uh, definitely support the, the efforts that we're doing here at the border. If you want to reach out to us and, and find ways of, of helping us out, but also help those that are right there in your own community that need your help and that need to be welcome. And just two more questions, I think, unless we're getting more from the audience. Um, if you have a question for Sister Norma, go ahead and put it in the chat now, please, because we only have her for another few more minutes. Um, sister, uh, how, how have you sustained a commitment to human rights through all these years and what keeps you positive and hopeful about the future? My days start very early in the morning and they end up very late and I end, ex end exhausted. But there, I end up with a sense of peace and, and assurance that I have done something good. So I, wish, I was able to make a child smile and I was able to embrace someone that was hurting and struggling. And I feel that that, that presence of God in me gives me the, the strength and the, the move forward to do something good. And every day with a great wanting, wanting us to, to do what I need to do for that day. And, uh, and I think that, that it comes from that presence of God in me, that it's a loving presence that is wanting to come out to to give that love to those that def desperately need it. And so um, that keeps me going and that gives me up every morning. And uh, I'm enthusiastic to be able to take part with others in, in finding solutions, in finding ways of making a difference in the life of those that need it. Yeah. We have a question from the audience. Um, she says, towards the end of the film, one of the volunteers is asked by one of the migrants, what happened to those who jump in the river? The answer given is no sabemos, we don't know. What exactly does that mean? What does happen to those who jump and who takes responsibility? You know, somebody that jumps into the river risks their lives and mm -hmm. some of them don't make it. You saw the picture of the dad with the little girl. He, he, uh, he was drowned with his little girl. All his hopes and dreams just ended at that tragic moment. Many like that also drowned and are lost and don't make it. Many of them do, others do, and they make it across. These past four years, they were all sent back. They were returned, deported, and, and forced back. Many of them now have an opportunity to move forward and to be able to, uh, to uh, follow a process, a legal process that can help them uh, see if they can remain in the United States legally through uh, asylum. So that's what happens to them if they take that risk and move forward and risk their lives to the hopes that they may can make it, you know? Yeah. And um, we have another question from Sandra. How many continue to help you out? How many help you out in your day-to-day -day work? 
there's so many people that if it weren't for the, the great support that I have from so many people, my staff to begin with, that work so hard to be able to, for me to accomplish what I do, and all of the people that contribute, whether it's financially volunteering through prayers, through that, just joining in this effort to reach out. You know, we do this together. It is an effort that is done as a community, as all of us, as a, as a human family, to be able to reach out to those. It is through those those coming together that that this is possible. You know, it's not done just by one person. It's all of us together. Uh, joining in this effort to make a difference in doing good. Okay, we only have a couple more minutes with Sister Norma, and we're getting questions about, do you have a wish list on Amazon? People are asking if they can donate. What's the best way to connect with you to actually engage in this work? There is, there definitely is a wish, wish list in my, uh, in my uh, Amazon, and you can always look for it. It's on under Catholic Charities RGB. We also have a website, you know, catholiccharitiesrgb.com org and and you can find their ways that you can volunteer you can help out and stories about what we're doing but um just call us or or find us and we and, and definitely you will find a way to uh, to support and to be part of because this is a historical moment in in life that that we must all be part of and we all have the opportunity to live out your faith your presence who you are what you believe in making a difference in, in this world today for the good. You know, uh, I just wanna share something with you all today. Today has been a magnificent day, a historical day, because today people in the camp that you saw at, at, in this video have started to cross over into the United States. Has, it has been so amazing to be part of that first step forward for all of these families that have suffered for almost two years are not giving now have been given the opportunity to cross through the points of entry, through the breach with their head high, never so dignified and so amazing after having suffered so long. Now they're walking through and here in the United States and the first small group of 25 just crossed today and tomorrow more will cross and the day after. It is a moment of grace, a moment of great blessings. And um, I thank everybody who became part of this great triumphant moment in life for these immigrants. That was exactly what I was about to ask. And what we're starting to get questions about is what's happening? What's, what's happening down at the border? Um, we're reading about it in the newspaper. So thank you for giving us that insight. I think that it, it feels really special to us, even just to be that, that tiny part of the movement who are open to learning about the issue. So thank you. And hearing it directly from you is incredible. Um, very exciting. Um, OK, so some of these questions we're going to direct on to uh, some other panelists because Sister Norma has important work to do. So Sister, thank you so, so much for being with us. Um, we wish you all of the best in your work. Thank you. Gracias. Bien con Dios. <laughs> Okay, um, perfect. So let's direct the next question to Lee. Welcome, Lee. From your perspective, how can our audience, um, actually, you know what, let me back up a little bit. Um, can you tell us about uh, the family separation policy that was in effect during the previous administration and how the effects of that policy are felt today? It would be helpful if you could discuss the scale of the policy's implementation as well. Yeah, sure. Well, let me just say um, thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be on this panel. Sister Norma is a hero to so many, but I also want to congratulate everyone involved with this film. Um, this was a powerful film, and I deal with this every day, these issues, but it was still moving and powerful to me, and I think that shows just how good a film it was. And I want to talk a little bit later after I let it set out this family separation practice, but just about the importance, uh, as Bob said in the, in the introduction of humanizing this population, because the only way these kinds of really barbaric policies can ever get implemented is if the government dehumanizes the population to such an extent that people sit back and, and accept it. Um, the family separation practice, I've been doing the civil rights work for nearly 30 years, and I would say that the family separation practice is the worst thing 
by far that I've seen in 30 years. And you saw one of the, the women in the film talk about how she made it here and then had her child taken away. And so what the family separation practice was, it was different than what you saw in the film with the Remain in Mexico practice, which is the whole family was sent to Mexico. And as you saw in the film, that was brutal, but at least the parent and child were together. What happened with many families, we now know more than 5,500 families is when the parents showed up with a child, the child was taken away and sent across the country to a child detention center, government facility. Often the parent wasn't even told where the child was taken. What we originally thought was, well, maybe these are teenagers, that would have been bad enough. But some of the children were only six or seven months old. Hundreds of them were just toddlers. They were ripped from their parents' arms, begging and screaming, please don't take me away. And that lasted months and months and months. The ACLU brought a lawsuit called Miss L. V. Ice, and the federal judge in San Diego said the policy was unconstitutional, called it brutal, said it shocks the conscience that the United States government would do this. And so we have been reuniting the families, but the Trump administration did not even disclose all the families at first, much less how to reach them. We are still three years later, unfortunately, looking for more than 500 families. We also know that hundreds and hundreds of other families who we have located remain separated because the Trump administration would not allow the parent to come back to the United States to reunify. And so I can talk a little bit later about what we're hoping from the Biden administration, but we really do hope the Biden administration will now allow these parents to reunify with their children in the United States, give them legal status, give them restitution, because the effect, even once we reunify the families, the trauma these children have suffered have suffered is so brutal. The medical community has called it straight out child abuse to the point where the trauma was so severe that the child's brain structure actually changed. I mean, we talked to parents where an 18 month old child was taken away and the mother had to stand there watching as the child craned her neck in the car being driven away to see their mother in the, in the rear. Uh, you know, just fathers asking, please let me have 30 seconds to brace my son, seven-year-old son for what was gonna happen. They wouldn't even give them the 30 seconds. The child just pulled away, begging, daddy, what's happening? Just one, one horrendous situation after another, a four-year-old boy who had glasses and the parents scraped together the money to, to buy them a glasses case so the glasses didn't break because they were very modest means and knew that they couldn't buy a second pair of glasses. When they came to take the little four-year-old Honduran boy away, he was begging, please don't take me, please don't take me. Fortunately, he had his glasses on, but they didn't let him get his glasses case. So all day long, all the mother was thought about is, can my little boy see? Will they show him where to put his glasses so they don't break? If they break, will he get him another pair of glasses? So we not only need to reunify these families, but we desperately need to get them help, including trauma, help because otherwise what we, the United States government has essentially created 5,000, 6,000 little children who may never have a normal life again, who are just gonna be this sense of vulnerability. I mean, I remember reunifying one family in the very beginning and the mother told me the four-year-old boy just keeps asking, are they gonna come and take me away again in the middle of the night? So the child's whole sense of, of safety, of well-being now has been completely shattered. And that's the kind of thing that you need real medical trauma help to, to deal with. Absolutely. Um, and one second, Bob, I'd like to um, come back to you for a moment. First, we have someone asking, is the musician still there in the camp? Bob, you're on mute. I believe it, I, I believe he is, but I believe there's very good news um, about the musician Ernesto, although I can't be specific as to exactly what it is, but I do believe that um, his future does not include long-term residents in the Matamoros camp. That's, that's what I can tell you. That's what I know. Um, I don't know the specifics of exactly when um, he'll be departing, but it's not bad news about Ernesto, it's really good news. 
Good. And Bob, is the final product of Oh Mercy what you expected? Did you include anything that surprised you or is there anything that you wish you could have included but weren't able to? Uh, it, it, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that very briefly, but I do, um, and let me do it by very quickly responding to what Lee said um, uh, about the, the, the neurological damage inflicted on young people that are forcibly mm -hmm. removed um, from, from their parents. And I, I, I you know, it's, it's beyond imagination, really. Um, and it's, it's, it's a way of answering your question that when I set out to make this film, and if you'll see at the end, it says, um, you know, undoing deliberate evil is complicated and it's gonna take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but that kind of thing is as close to deliberate evil as I can certainly um, imagine as a, as, as a, a, you know, a, a father and a grandfather. Um, so there is a sense in which and so let me back up very quickly and say that I don't think anyone who sets out to create something knows exactly how it's going to turn out at the end. Um, I had this, uh, you know, an artist puts colors uh, on a palette and it's blue and green and red and ochre and all these colors and there's a sketch on the canvas maybe but, you know, what, what starts is not necessarily what ends up and I, I certainly had this idea that um, that O oh Mercy uh, should in, in many ways be an examination of, 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 of what true evil is, which is how I view the policies of the last four years. But having said that, um, yeah, it, it, it turned out to be what it is, you know? Um, and uh, I, I'm frankly pleased with, with, with that uh, because you asked about my expectations and I think it's, a reasonably solidly constructed little movie. And I was pleased about the way we worked in with Sister Norma, who um, I admire along with everyone else. So those are my answers to that question. Yeah, thank you. Angelica, we'd love to hear from you again. I have two questions. Um, first, why do you feel that it is important to share your story? Why do you want to do these kinds of speaking engagements? Angélica, otra pregunta, por favor. ¿Por qué sientes que es importante de, uh, de, de, de que la gente sepan uh, lo que pasó contigo? ¿Por qué es importante para ti que la gente uh, sea enterada de todo lo que pasó en este, en este viaje? Para que se den cuenta de que en nuestro país hay bastante delincuencia y para que se den cuenta de que ustedes también me han apoyado demasiado y quiero anteriormente pues no, no hablaba de mi historia porque no simplemente no, no podía me dolía bastante solo por recordar todo lo que he vivido y por eso es que no podía contar nada de mi historia pero ahorita quiero que ellos sepan de, de que de que yo he sufrido demasiado y que no es por gusto que yo estoy aquí y ahorita que ya tengo a mi hija pues tengo muchos planes que hacer con ella y igual para agradecerles a ustedes de que me han apoyado bastante. Muchas gracias. Uh, first, I want my story to be shared because I want the people to know to what level the violence and the crime in my, in my country is. And uh, I also wanted to share my story so people that know that there is help and I've been helped here by, by you. Uh, and I wanted to, to tell them that it was not easy except to, to save my, my daughter's life. I'm not here because I simply chose to for a better life. And uh, I want my story to be shared because it's not, I want it to, to be shared now because people are hearing now, despite the fact that it's really hurting me. Before, when it was all this happening, it was difficult to me to, to share it because I was suffering also when I share it. Now that I have seen some help, it is easier for me to share. 
we're so grateful to you. Um, and I know the audience is too, because it's not every day that we get to understand um, from someone who has gone through it, what you have gone through. And it helps us to be able to support you and people um, who are going through what you went through. So thank you as always. Um, Anhalika is a great advocate and she's worked with us for a while. And um, we're, we're very grateful to all of our panelists, but um, especially for Anhalika sharing her story. Um, as I know, all of you are as well. Les agradecemos mucho, Angélica, uh, tu apariencia aquí y sabemos que tú fuiste siempre un gran abogado a toda la gente que han pasado que han sufrido demasiado como tú. Eh, tenemos, tienes todo, todo nuestro respeto y nuestro agradecimiento. And um, Angelica, can you share with us the next part of your story as you're, you left Guatemala and can you tell us a little bit about what happened on the way to the United States um, as you crossed Mexico? Arita, nuestro, la, la, la segunda parte de nuestra pregunta para ti es que, ¿cómo, cómo, uh, primero, primero, cómo pasaste por la frontera y la, 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 la parte antes de la frontera? ¿Qué pasó contigo en México? Y luego podían platicar después ¿Cómo es la vida aquí? Pero primero empezamos con México. ¿Cuándo me regresaron a Matamoros en el campamento o no? When they, uh, you want to know when I reached Matamoros, the, the camp, or a little before that? A little before that. Basically, from the time you left Guatemala to the time you got to the camp. Antes de esto, prácticamente desde que decidiste de dejar de saliste de Guatemala hasta llegar al campo. Sí. Este, salimos con un grupo de personas, eh, también padres de familia, eh, me apoyaron bastante en el camino, veníamos en grupos y allá en, como le dicen, en un país, en un... ¿En un estado? Ajá, en un estado de, de México. Ay, la verdad que ya ni me acuerdo el nombre pero es de, antes de llegar a Reynosa, este, nos, nos, pues ahí ya no, ya no teníamos quien nos podía ayudar, ahí fue que, este, un señor nos encontró y que supuestamente nos iba a ayudar, pero no era cierto, sino que era para secuestrarnos. Ok, permítame un segundito, voy a traducir esto y luego regresando a ti. After we left uh, Guatemala, we went with several groups of people, also fathers and mothers of them, and, and families. We were helping each other, and they were helping me. Until we reached a uh, little bit before uh, Rio Noso in, uh, in Mexico. Then I met someone that said he would help us, but then he did not. And luego, ¿qué pasó, Angelica? Encontraste esta persona. Después de que nos, de, llegamos a Reynosa, nos dijeron de que teníamos que pagar mil dólares y yo no tenía dinero para pagar esa cantidad. Y como aquí nadie podía pagar esa cantidad y los que tenían padres de familia aquí, pues ellos pagaron y nosotros éramos como cinco personas Tres adultos y dos niños nos quedamos ahí porque no teníamos cómo pagar. Permítame. This person said to us, what was, what was armed, said to us, now, in order to make you continue the journey, help you continue the journey, you have to pay $1,000 per person. And I didn't have any money to pay. Some other people that have a family here or somebody who support them sent them this money and they paid, but five persons, including her and her daughter, uh, sorry, including her and then two other uh, minors were not able to pay this money. And she was already pregnant at this time. Luego. Luego de eso, como no teníamos dinero, nos dijo que nos iba a entregar a los Zetas para que ahí, a ver si ellos nos iban a creer que no teníamos dinero. Y ahí fue que nos quedamos, casi estuve ahí un mes, estar ayudándole al Señor, dándole comida a las personas que ha llegado. 
él creo que él se encarga de, no sé si secuestrar personas, porque han llegado bastantes personas y nosotras, yo estando embarazada, yo andaba trabajando mm -hmm. ahí. Until, and at this point, when we didn't have money to pay, they said, all right, we will give you to the, the famous gang Las Tetas in Mexico. And uh, we would deliver to them. And I kept working for them, especially for this person that clearly he, or he was charged or his role was to kidnap more people and make them work or make them pay. So those who didn't pay, such as her, when she was pregnant, she was actually working for them, giving food to them, giving food to this person that told her this uh, and working all day. Y estando ahí, este, yo eh, creo que me desmayé como tres veces porque no comíamos mucho. A nosotros no nos iban, no nos daban comida, tanta comida porque no teníamos cómo pagar todo eso. Even those days when I was working for them, especially for this person, I lost my conscious three times. Even when I was pregnant because there was not enough food for anyone. Especially for her, there wasn't any food. They feed them almost nothing. So I used to lose my 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 power, lose my, my force, and then just completely lost lose conscience. Anyway. Luego, este, nos hizo pintar su casa, que pintáramos adentro, pero que no nos asomáramos en la ventana. Entonces, pintamos toda su casa. Y en ese, al día siguiente, nos dijo que nos iba a dejar ir. We, he asked us to paint all his house, but never look through the windows. And after, he, he told them, after, if you finish painting my house, I will let you go. Y luego, ¿qué, qué pasó? ¿Les dejó ir? Pensaba, yo pensaba que nos iba a matar. Porque como no, no pagamos nada, yo pensé que nos iba a pagar a, a matar, pero no fue así, sino que nos, nos dejó ir para cruzar. Y entonces ahí fue que yo me entregué a mi gracia. Then, after a few, few days, he, uh, I thought he was going to whether kill us or keep us this, there forever because we, we, we couldn't pay. But then, after a few days, he let us go. And that is when I uh, surrendered to the immigration officers in the United States. Thank you, Angelica. And we're going to come back and hear some more of your story here in just a few moments. Um, Lee. Entonces, Angelica, nada más uh, eh, vamos a regresar a escuchar de ti otra vez después unas preguntitas. Espero con todos. Sí. Thank you. And uh -huh. uh, Lee, what is the Biden administration currently doing to reunite families? And what are their plans for alleviating the situation for asylum seekers going forward? Sorry, sorry about that. Um, those are good questions, you know, and I think a lot of people are waiting to see. On the family reunification, they have created a task force. And the task force is supposedly going to reunite families, um, look for potential ways to give them status so they can stay here, uh, restitution, all those things are on the table. But I think having been doing this for three years and been in court for three years, I'm anxious to see it done already, you know? And so I think what we will be looking at is how quickly are they going to do it? And are they going to carry through? Are they going to talk about this in the beginning, but not ultimately carry through. I, I remain optimistic that the Biden administration will do something on family separation, but we will, we will hold them to it and, and continue to pressure them. With respect to asylum more, more generally, um, I think that's a more complicated question. They are ending the remain in Mexico policy. As Sister Norma said, they've allowed people in today, but it's only a trickle at this point. And so I think that's another situation where we're asking them to move quicker. I mean, these are people who have been living in, in a dire situation for years now. And so we want to see them. They say they're going to do it 
uh, quickly, we'll see. But the other thing that I think people should understand is that they have kept one of the most pernicious Trump administration policies in place, and that's called the Title 42 policy. And that was a policy that the Trump administration enacted saying, we can't let any asylum seekers in the country because of COVID. Now, we know that was a pretext for the Trump administration because they weren't doing everything they could about COVID, needless to say. And what we understood that policy to be is nothing short of the Trump administration just wanting to keep Central American asylum seekers out. Now, the Biden administration, unfortunately, has said, well, we don't have the ability to let everyone in now, so we're going to keep that policy in place. We have sued about that. We are going to negotiate. But that's a very troubling thing, because if they don't end that policy, then they can continue to just push asylum seekers back. And so what we have seen during the first month of the Biden administration is them summarily expelling people back to the most dangerous places in the world without any asylum hearing whatsoever. So, you know, what the ACLU believes is Democratic or Republican administration, we need to hold them accountable. We need to make sure they comply with the law. But, but ultimately, you know, what I, what I worry about is the legal arguments are powerful and we can go into court, but unless we can humanize this population with films like this, I think that that's really ultimately the key. When we saw a pushback about family separation, it's because we finally got the word out the stories of these children and families and people reacted very viscerally at a gut level. And it wasn't just Democrats and liberals, it was Republicans, it was the Pope, it was conservative religious leaders, it was Laura Bush, where people said, well, these are little children, what are we doing? And films like this showing that it's not just family separation, but there's other Trump administration policies made, making families live like these in these conditions um, is so brutal. and. We need to see it up close. We can't turn away. And I think what happens a lot of times is people don't really understand the border and it's just sort of sight on sight, not a mind. We need to bring it into people's kind of so when they go to sleep at night, they're thinking about that little boy sleeping in that tent for, for these two years. And so it becomes not an abstract policy discussion, not a discussion about aggregate statistics. It becomes a discussion, as Bob has said and Sister Norma has said about real people. And I think having an actual asylum seeker here on this panel is so important and so critical to hear directly from her what she has suffered. Thank you, I agree. Bob, um, what would you say has been the most challenging aspect of this project? And can you tell us what comes next for you in your work? You're on mute, Bob. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, two challenges. Uh, the first was length in, in keeping with, you know, what Lee said about the need to reach large numbers of people and change this narrative somewhat. We felt very strongly that we needed to make a short film um, that people would actually watch and could watch on their cell phones, you know, that fit within the time frame of people in general today who are stressed out his attention pan is short, you know, so we decided that it needed to be a short form um, movie. Now, um, <laughs> that's a real challenge. Short is hard. Uh, I, I, I love to quote Abraham Lincoln who wrote to his senator, you know, senator to take up this issue uh, that you've discussed. Um, I wanted to write you um, a short letter, but I don't have the time. So this will be a long letter, <laughs> right? Um, and short is hard and that was a challenge. Um, related to that was the amount of basic information that we felt needed to go into this little movie that we want everybody to try to watch so that we're all kind of working, as he said, from a, a same basis. And that include who are these people? What are push factors? Um, why have they been stuck at the border for so long? Who are they? We, we don't know them. We don't. Um, as Sister says, when I go to sleep at night, I, I think about them, but Sister knows who they are. You know, she sees them. So our objective was to really humanize 
uh, these folks um, who I think are, have been stereotyped and dehumanized and, you know, put a lot of information into this little film that, that people could respond to and say, oh, okay, I'm with you, I get this. And then you go to the next step again, like Lee said, and start holding um, and use that information to hold uh, the Biden administration, for instance, their feet to the fire. You know, I'm not convinced that, that and, and uh, you know, that everything's just gonna be hunky-dory now. I think there's some hope, but I think that hope needs to be measured by very realistic expectations is what's gonna happen and, 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 and what's not. And uh, I, in that respect, I think we're still in for a long haul. Um, what's next? Uh, oh, Mercy uh, is actually part of a larger project called The Oh Mercy Project. It's one film of about seven, six, five, I don't know, films like that that are going to attempt to look at the realities of the immigration issue in this country as a whole. Um, this film, for instance, does not include a discussion of what happens to people once they do get inside the United States. So we need to like take a hard look at that, look at children, um, et cetera. So that's what's next is O Mercy 2. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience for Angelica. She says, I would like to know what Angelica thinks of herself. Her story is painful to hear and she comes off as unbelievably strong to have made it through. I agree. How would she describe herself? Angelica, we have a question very important from the audience. Rita, people see that I am a person strong, a person who has been able to pass through all this and still is here viviendo, intentando de ver la vida, es una persona por, su, por supuestamente muy fuerte. ¿Cómo tú ves a tú mismo? ¿Tú ves a tú mismo así igual de fuerte? ¿Cómo me veo a mí misma? Sí. Es una, es una pregunta difícil, ya sé, porque lo más difícil en el, en el mundo de, de juzgar quién somos, lo sé, pero intenta de contestar. Uh, me considero una persona fuerte, um, independiz me, me, me he independizado y estoy muy orgullosa de mí misma a pesar de muchas cosas que he pasado. Este, me siento muy orgullosa de mí misma. Mi, es como por decirle que logré lo que tanto soñaba, tener a mi hija a mi lado y es mi mayor Era mi mayor deseo de verla, de cargarla, y lo he hecho. Y ahora que he salido adelante sola, este, muchas personas me lo han dicho eh, que, que cómo lo hago, que cómo es que, que salgo adelante con mi hija, estamos viviendo sola, sino que a veces me acuerdo de mi pasado y eso es lo que me impulsa a ser una mejor persona para mi hija, para que no tenga necesidad de, de tener un padre a su lado. Y también soy muy sentimental que lloro por veo. cualquier cosa. It's okay. That first, well, I am, I know I am. I think I am strong, and I am. I am. Uh, I didn't know that about myself in the beginning, but but I am become to really be uh, proud of myself because I did what I. The first thing I wanted to do, which is basically what I was trying to do, is to be able to carry my daughter and see her alive, and I did that. And then uh, many people ask me. Uh, how do you do? How how can you how how are you be, how are you able to put up with all this? And then uh, and then having the, the the ability the capacity to continue. And uh, I see that's why I see myself uh, strong. Of course, still in myself, I I I have many uh, many other things in my character, uh, and. I, it is difficult for me to remember sometimes me, some of the things that I've been and I have done. Uh, 
but always uh, there is always future. Sometimes uh, I become weak. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I wish uh, I still have a man in my life to help me and to help my daughter. Uh, but I still go. And, and I also, one of my defects that I am a very sentimental person. But, and then she laughed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm gonna start replacing some of my own questions with some from the audience because we have some really good ones. Um, I think this one is directed more toward Lee and it came in um, yesterday or the day before actually. So the question is, what do you think are the root causes of immigration? It seems to me that we must confront the factors that push our sisters and brothers to leave their homes. Why is there such discord and danger in their own countries? For me, it goes back to US foreign policy, political and economic and the climate crisis. Thank you, Father Bob Bossi. Yeah, that's an excellent question and a complicated one. Um, but the, the short answer, at least for me, is that we need to do something to help these countries. I, I probably don't have enough time to get to go back to whether these are all factors related to our foreign policy. I think, you know, those are obviously bigger questions, but needless to say, I, I think Sister Norma made the point earlier and it's absolutely right. People don't wanna get up and leave their countries for all of the reasons no one wants to get up and leave their own country. And moreover, it is very dangerous. This notion out there amongst people that, oh, people just at a drop of a hat pick up and, and make this journey and leave their homes is wrong. There are push factors, there are lots of push factors, climate change, economics, but I think what you're seeing in this movie is that danger is the number one issue and people don't wanna leave. I, when I would ask families when they got here, would you have come anyway if you would knew your child was gonna be taken from you? And they just shrug and say, well, what choice did I have? I couldn't stay, I couldn't have my son be killed or be forced into a gang. I was gonna be killed. And so I think we have to do something about those push factors. And I think the Biden administration is committed to, to helping those countries. And I, that's a longer term move. And so we have to create a humane asylum system here, but we also need to look at the push factors because there is this, this narrative out there from people, oh, people are just coming to collect welfare checks and that kind of thing and nothing could be further from the truth. I think you're hearing it today, the kinds of push factors that go on and why people leave and they don't wanna leave, but if they are, we cannot turn our backs on them. We said after World War II, we would never turn our back on vulnerable people seeking refuge in this country. And now there's a lot of people I think are forgetting their history. They're also forgetting their own family's history their own community's history, when they needed help, America welcomed them. And now I think there's a, a feeling of, oh, well, these Central Americans, they don't really need help. And there's been so much dehumanizing of them and we're ready to abandon these principles that I think we all thought were sacred once we, we, we put them in place after World War II. And so I think if the Biden administration doesn't get our asylum system back in place, we are at a real turning point in America. And that would be a sad day if the policies of the Trump administration continue. We, we need to recognize these principles, but at the same time as the question suggested, we need to make things better in those countries and also take responsibility for what part we played in them. Thank you. And I have so many more questions. I could talk about this for hours, um, but we are, uh, we only have about nine more minutes left tonight. And so I'd like to hear from everyone um, just one more time. I apologize for any questions that we weren't able to get to. This is such a deep issue um, and there's so many amazing perspectives here. So I'm so grateful for all of you for, for being here and sharing your perspective. Um, I just like to go around once and ask if uh, you have any parting words for us uh, any last message that you'd like to get through to our audience tonight? Bob, would you like to go first? Not really, but I will. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Oh gosh, uh, it's so much that's been said tonight is 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 correct. It's useful. It's inspiring. Um, I, I guess what I have to add is uh, again picking up on on what Lee has just said is that we're we're looking at some really big picture kind of issues here with respect not only to the future of humane immigration policies in the United States, but how we deal with the global forced migration issue. You know, there are 80, 90, 100 million forced migrants in the world today, and they um, have been uh, forced to leave their homes. You know, the, 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 that great line from the poem, I can't remember the author's name, you don't leave home unless home is the jaw of a shark. Um, people have been forced to leave their homes by forces beyond their control and circumstances. And you say, why? Well, no food. Why? Poverty, gang violence, um, uh, climate change. And, you know, you get, when you start to look at the issue this way, you start looking at things that are seemingly at first unrelated to the actual reality of global migration. And you start to look at, well, you know, what, how is climate change creating these and who's responsible for that? So it's very important, I think, for people to start connecting the dots here a little bit and understanding why these issues exist in the first place. And um, I think there are lots of different ways for folks to, to do that. Um, what we're trying to do is simply make it a little bit easier to understand uh, who migrants are, why these changes have occurred, what the push factors are, and um, you know, keep a deep faith in, as Sister says, humanity, that th th there will be a positive response. I myself have that faith. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I'm a glass half full kind of a guy, not a glass half empty kind of a guy. Um, so I say, God, you know, God bless everyone. Let's move forward. Keep the faith, you know, and keep keep the Biden administration's feet to the fire. Thank you. Thank you. Angelica, do you have any last words for our audience? If there's one message that you'd like to share, what is that? Angelica, si tienes un mensaje última para para la audiencia, si tienes un consejo si quieres participar con nosotros hoy. Que muchas gracias por escucharme y por interesarse en mi historia. Yo sé que mi vida no no todo es de color de rosas y he sufrido bastante y a veces necesito eh, con quien desahogarme y muchas gracias por escucharme de verdad que se los agradezco bastante y, y gracias por, por preocuparse por nosotras junto con mi hija y es, siempre estaremos agradecida con usted uh, I want to really thank you all for, uh, for helping me and for being interested in my story I know it's not all pink uh, and uh, we have suffered uh, enough uh, but I really thank you all for uh, for listening and being there for us. Thank you, Angelica. Lee, do you have any parting words for us? Um, just briefly, I wanted to pick up on something that Sister Norma said about that she would consider it a good day if she made one child smile. And I hear a lot from people, and especially young people, these problems are too big, they're too daunting. I can't really fix them. What could I really do? And I think that is a mindset that we really need to fight against. What, what I would urge people is just do any little thing, make a child smile, send one bottle of water, send a backpack for one child so they have a place to put their books to go to school. If you speak, a different language, tutor one child. If you can do more, great, but do any little piece because it is, you read the paper and it feels like these daunting big problems and maybe only, you know, a lawyer can do it or sister, but you see just little things can help people. And so it's really important just to do any little thing you can. And even if it's what sister Norma said is just welcome someone, be nice to a, a, a migrant refugee. Um, 
any little thing, but it, I, I think I, I see it very often, this feeling of the problems are too big. So me sending a few bottles of water is not gonna do much, but it, it really is. And the other thing is speak out, you know, sign petitions, raise yours. It really does matter for, especially the Biden administration, for them to hear from people. And, it, and because otherwise the issues just get swept under the rug they are gonna prioritize the issues they think people are paying attention to. So speak out and do any little thing you can do. That's a great way to close this presentation. Thank you, Lee. Thank you uh, to all of the panelists tonight. Thank you, Bob and team for this incredible film. And thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. Um, everyone who attended will be receiving a follow-up email, which will contain the streaming link for O oh Mercy, along with a link to an O oh Mercy film discussion and resource guide. Please go ahead and visit the website, omercyfilm.com, for more background on the film. And please tell your friends, family, and colleagues to visit the website to obtain their own link to the film. This is an incredible gift, really, that Worldwide Documentaries is giving us all for free um, to share and use. And so it's now our responsibility to share and use it. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Refugee Services of Texas, we operate statewide and we would love to hear from you. We also have a virtual event on March 4th featuring worldwide documentaries, This Is Not My Life, and I encourage you to register for free. Um, please visit our website at rstx.org. And thank you so much for being here. Good night, everybody.